The supraspinatus muscle originates from the supraspinous fossa in front of the spine of the scapula and above it. Its course runs forwards and outwards, and this is very important to understand when performing ultrasound, thus traveling under an anatomical arch which we can see here. It is formed back of the acromion, in the center of the acromioclavicular joint, and in front of the coracoacromial ligament, which extends from the coracoid process to the acromion in an outward direction. This tendon will then run outwards and insert on the greater tubercle of the humerus via a tendon whose architecture is complex. It is formed anteriorly by an anterior bundle and posteriorly by a flat plate. The precise anatomy of the greater tubercle warrants a description. In fact, it has three insertion facets. The first is horizontal and receives the supraspinatus. The second is oblique and receives the infraspinatus. The third is vertical and more posterior and receives the teres minor. It is interesting to observe this anatomy on a skeleton like this one. In neutral position, the greater tubercle is relatively imprisoned under the acromion. In order to make the tendons accessible to the ultra ultrasound transducer, it helps to place the arm in retropulsion in order to free, especially, the anterior part of the greater tubercle in a forward direction. Opposite the tendons of the rotator cuff, there is a serous bursa known as the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, which is shown here in blue. It penetrates inwards under the acromion and runs outwards along the humerus but also forwards superficial to the subscapularis and backwards superficial to the infraspinatus. We will now go on to study the anterior superior region and its main tendon, that is, the supraspinatus. Earlier we found, in the course of our anatomical study, that the acromion, that bony structure located here, interferes considerably with access to the supraspinatus. In order to free it, we must carry out the following maneuver. The hand is placed on the patient's buttock, resulting in retropulsion and adduction. Thus, the supraspinatus will be completely freed under the acromial protuberance. We will begin the exploration of the supraspinatus by a long axis image of that muscle. You can see that the long axis, the direction must be that of my transducer right now, that is oblique upwards and inwards. A little trick which allows you to check that your image is properly achieved in the correct plane consists in looking at the orientation of the fibers of the deltoid, which is overlying here. If they are perfectly parallel, lying along their longest axis, your image is in a satisfactory plane. Before detailing the internal echo pattern of the supraspinatus, please note that it is shaped like a bird beak whose convexity faces upwards. On this long axis image of the supraspinatus in the deep plane, we can recognize the cartilage of the humeral head. Here, a little further inwards on the greater tubercle, the fibrocartilage corresponding to the insertion of the tendon of the supraspinatus muscle onto the bone. A little further inwards, an area of anisotropy which corresponds to a change in the direction of the fibers. That anisotropy can be counted by directing the transducer differently. Still on the same image, in favorable cases we may be lucky enough to visualize the anterior cylindrical bundle, which we can see here in the form of a perfectly parallel fibers that look like a tendon within the tendon. Superficial to the supraspinatus muscle tendon, we notice this non-fibular area, which corresponds to the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. A fixed image of this coronal image over the supraspinatus is not enough for a comprehensive study of that tendon. We will have to move the transducer backwards and then forwards in order to get this image in the long axis of the horizontal portion of the long biceps. We will now perform a series of short axis images of the supraspinatus. So here is the direction of the transducer, exactly perpendicular to the previous one. The biceps tendon is positioned on this side of the screen, and this part that you see here corresponds to the supraspinatus. The first 15 to 20 millimeters correspond to the supraspinatus. More posteriorly, we will re-encounter the infraspinatus. In favorable cases, we can attempt to see the anterior bundle by using an isotropy, which is what we are doing here. Another way of locating the supraspinatus, infraspinatus junction, consists in moving the transducer outwards and in evidencing the insertion surfaces on the greater tubercle. The horizontal surface corresponds to the insertion of the supraspinatus, the oblique surface to that of the infraspinatus. <laughs>
la surface oblique à la trait épineux. We will now talk about the rotator cuff interval, which is located in the upper part of the intertubercular groove. That rotator cuff interval is an anatomical space whose forward boundary is the upper border of the subscapularis tendon, while its posterior boundary is the anterior border of the supraspinatus tendon. It includes the long biceps tendon when it's turned downward from the joint cavity. It is held in place by the pulley, which includes the superior glenohumeral ligament, as well as the two bundles of the coracohumeral ligament, which is prolonged in a backward direction by a structure called the rotator cuff cable, running deep to the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons. We will now detail an especially important image relating to what is known as the rotator cuff interval. Starting from the short axis image over the supraspinatus, we move the transducer gently downwards in order to achieve this image, where you can see here, at the bottom, the subscapularis, here, the biceps tendon, and here, the supraspinatus tendon. Let's continue with the ligamentary components of the rotator cuff interval, with a ligament sling formed here, by the superior glenohumeral ligament. Here, by the coracohumeral ligament and its two bundles, this interval extends, as we can guess here thanks to the rotator cuff cable, along the deep aspect of the supraspinatus. In order to obtain a fine sagittal image of the supraspinatus muscle within its fossa, the transducer is placed in this way. The image must show three absolutely mandatory bony protuberances. The first is the clavicle anteriorly, the second is the spine of the scapula posteriorly, the third is the upper border of the scapula here. Superficially, you will note the trapezius muscle. Everything you see on the image beside it between the bony protuberances is in fact the supraspinatus muscle. In order to obtain a fine coronal image of the supraspinatus muscle within its fossa, we start from the sagittal image. Then we revolve the transducer in an oblique coronal plane. The muscle is thus visualized. We see it running outward here under the acromial arch. On this image, please note here, against the upper border of the scapula, a small vascular structure corresponding to the suprascapular pedicle. The acromioclavicular joint binds the medial border of the acromion on the one hand with the distal end of the clavicle on the other hand. The stabilizing components include a powerful acromioclavicular ligament, which is located superiorly, and two coracoclavicular ligaments stretching between the coracoid process and the clavicle, consisting in a conoid ligament and a trapezoid ligament. In front of the coracoclavicular ligaments, please note a small artery, which is the acromial artery. And now here is the acromiocoracoid ligament. We will now begin the exploration of the acromioclavicular joint with the superficial coronal image, which allows us to evidence the acromioclavicular ligament here, just superficial to the bony protuberances. We will continue with a dynamic maneuver known as the cross arm maneuver, which consists in positioning the patient's hand on the opposite shoulder and simultaneously checking the movements of the acromioclavicular joint. The right diastasis must remain small, the amplitude of the movements must be small in normal cases. In order to round off our study of the acromioclavicular joint, we will attempt to evidence the coracoclavicular ligaments. Let's start with this image over the apex of the coracoid process. We now attempt to extend that coracoid process along its greater axis, the narrowest part between the coracoid and the clavicle corresponds to the coracoclavicular ligaments. Here is the coinoid part, here is the trapezoid part, just deep to this acromial artery. Let's complete the exploration of the anterior superior region by evidencing the acromiocoracoid ligament. That ligament extends from the tip of the coracoid, and by directing our transducer a little, we succeed in extending it fully from the tip of the coracoid here, to the anterior body of the acromion. There are several dynamic maneuvers we can use to look for acromial impingement. The first we can show is the one described by Nathalie Bureau. It consists in positioning the supraspinatus tendon to the left of the image, opposite the acromion to the right, and in asking the patient to perform an internal rotation, elbows extended, to perform an abduction and antipulsion at around 60%. 
We travel back down, we test several times, while observing the greater tubercle and the tendon as they slide under the acromion. The second dynamic maneuver that can be described when looking for subacromial impingement is the near maneuver, arms abducted with medial rotation. During this maneuver, we will see how the supraspinatus tendon behaves under the coracoacromial ligament. We locate it in the longitudinal plane as we did earlier. We perform a 90 degree turn and we ask the patient to carry out internal rotation movements of that abducted arm. We then observe the behavior of the supraspinatus tendon and of the bursa under the coracoacromial ligament, which we can see to the right of the image.